Okay. Yeah. So we'll get started. Why don't we uh, take some time to pray? Right. Let's um, let's pray. And even as we pray, um, let's pray as the Bible says. Let's pray in the spirit. Right. Um, we see in one Corinthians fourteen, Paul is saying, "I will pray in the spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. I will also sing with the understanding." So praying with the spirit is praying in tongues, praying as led by the Spirit of God, right? So whenever we see that phrase, praying in the Spirit, it's about praying in tongues, okay? So let's take some time to do that. Yeah, Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Just want you to just open up your mouths and um, pray audibly, right? So that you can hear your voice. And also online students, I just want to encourage you to just pray so that uh, it's loud enough for you to hear. Right. If you're in a place and if your environment permits that, um, just go ahead and just pray in the spirit, pray in tongues. Let's go ahead, just pray, continue to pray, continue to pray strong, um, continue to pray. And for those of us who are, and those of us who have not yet begun to pray in tongues, um, you know, maybe you've been praying and asking the Lord. Um, just want to encourage you to take a step of faith, okay? Like we saw uh, earlier, we saw that the Holy Spirit gives us the utterance, but we are the ones who speak out. So uh, the sounds are the utterances, the words are the sounds. So what he puts in our heart, just go ahead, take a step of faith and speak that out, right? Utter that out. Yeah, continue to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, almost center, it is she got yeah, I just want to uh, um, want us to know that uh, the Bible declares that as we pray in the Spirit, we are being built up, we are edified in the inner man. So we are becoming stronger in the inner man. Our spirit man is becoming stronger in the things of God, stronger to resist the works of the enemy. We are receiving discernment and sensitivity to the speaking or leading of the Holy Spirit, right? So continue to press in strong. Yes, Lord, we want more of that. We want to be strong in the Spirit. Yes, Lord, we want to be strong, O oh God, and sensitive, O oh God, to the leading, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We want to be able to receive the mysteries, the revelations of God from the Holy Spirit in our heart. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Father God. We thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you. We pray that for each one, each one of us, Lord, we pray that we would increase in our prayer life, O oh God. 
we would go to the next level in our prayer life, O oh Father God. Especially, Lord, praying in the Spirit, O oh Father God. We pray that uh, you would enable us to spend the extended time praying in the Spirit. And even as we do so, may we be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. May we receive, may we be recipients of the mysteries, of the understanding of the mysteries of God. O oh God, we pray, O oh God, may your love, the love of God, may it be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord, may our faith increase, O oh God, even as we pray in the Spirit. And Lord, we pray, O oh God, that we'll be, uh, Lord, uh, diligent doers, Lord, of your work, diligent doers of the Word, Lord, even as we pray in the Spirit. We thank you. We come at this time. We come at um, these classes into your mighty hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, yeah, I just want to encourage us to pray. And those of us who, uh, who can pray in the Spirit, you know, just continue to pray in tongues. You can pray whenever, wherever, right? So this, it's not like only when I'm in church or only when I'm in class, you know, I should pray in the Spirit. But you can pray whenever, wherever. When you're walking around, you can pray in tongues. You can, um, you know, when you're in your quiet time, when you're listening to music, you know, you can pray in tongues, right? can pray whenever, wherever, and, and that's the best part. Right? The Holy Spirit prays that perfect, the mind of Christ, the, uh, the heart of God to us, uh, in and through us, right? Okay, so uh, today's class, uh, before we get into today's class, anyone remember what we studied yesterday, our last class, last week? What is that one thing? Whoa, a lot of responses. Okay, one, yeah. Holy Spirit? The way Holy Spirit worked in Jesus' life, okay. What was that one thing that you remember? How he worked? Huh? How did he how did the Lord how did the Holy Spirit work in the life of Jesus? Holy Spirit? No, no, in the life of Jesus. In the life of Jesus. Okay, so. Mm. So the ministry of Jesus, the signs, wonders, and miracles, the supernatural things that he did, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled him to do that. How can you say that? How can you say that? How do you know that? How can we say for sure? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, the Bible says that, but where and where? We need to know for sure, right? Yeah? Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, right? Uh, where Peter's testifying to the fact that the Lord Jesus, he went about doing good and destroying the works of the enemy, and he did so by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, another place is also in Luke chapter 4, where we see uh, the Lord Jesus uh, reading from the book of Isaiah. And he says, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. He reads from Isaiah and then he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, right? And uh, he went about, right. Okay, any other things that you remember from last class? What, do you, what is it that you recall? Online students as well from last um, two hours that we spent last week. What is it that you remember? What is it that you learnt? about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, how the Holy Spirit worked in the life of um, you know these men of God, Jehaziel, Ezekiel, and how when they, when they, the Holy Spirit came upon Jehaziel especially, he prophesied. You know, Although we see that as a recurring uh, phenomenon, right, in the in the lives of these men. Yes. Okay. What else? Anything that you learned last class? Um, any any one thing? that you learned, Joseph? Yeah. 
one thing that you heard, learned. Right. Yeah. So um, about the birth of the Lord Jesus, how the Holy Spirit revealed right, to Mary and to Joseph and uh, who he will be and what he will be called, etc. Right. Very good. Anyone else? OK. So the Lord uh, has given us uh, the same authority, power, and Holy Spirit. We're going to look at that. Yes, uh, Shani. About how the Holy Spirit um, revealed himself to Mary and also Elizabeth and also about sonship glory. Right. Yeah. What the Lord, um, uh, how the Holy Spirit moved in uh, Mary's life, Elizabeth's life. And we also learned about sonship glory. Very important. Yeah. So which is what, to, uh, I, th I think that's where we stopped uh, about the glory, um, the sonship glory. Okay, so let's uh, just revisit that again. Okay, so we read that the Lord Jesus, John chapter 1, talks about the fact that the, um, let's, let's go to John chapter 1. Okay, John chapter 1 says that um, uh, the word, uh, verse 14, okay, John chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so uh, John is saying, you know, we he came, he dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, and uses the word doxa, which means what God did, who he was, and what he did in a very simple way, right? So we saw his glory. Glory, he says, and and what did what did they see? They basically saw the life of Jesus. Right? They saw the life and the ministry of Jesus. He said we beheld His glory, which means they saw what Jesus spoke, or they heard what Jesus spoke. They saw the way He lived His life. They saw the way He ministered, okay? which is again leading back to Acts chapter ten thirty eight. He the good things that He did. The good things, the supernatural works, the deliverance, the healing, right? everything that he did, and the Bible calls it good, right? And we see that they saw his glory, okay? And um, in fact, it says um, in um, um, and so John chapter fifteen uh, talks about the fact that John bore witness. Um, John chapter one verse fifteen, sorry. That John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, "This is this was he of whom I said, who com comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me." Okay, so it's talking about the eternal uh, the existence or pre-existence of the Lord Jesus, which means that it's not that this is something which happened at birth, but Jesus was right. He 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 was there at creation, okay, which is also scripture testifies. So when we now turn to John chapter 17, okay, John chapter 17 and um, verse 5, we see the Lord praying, he's talking to the Father, and this is what he says, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world began, or before the world was. Okay, So the Lord is saying, you know, I was with the Father. In other words, we learn that he was with the Father. And he had a glory which he actually stepped out of when he came to the earth. Okay, So John chapter 1, verse 14 says, we beheld his glory. And here the Lord himself says, now glorify me with the glory which I once had before the world was. So we see two different things. The Lord is saying, you know, I'm walking, which in, in other words, the Lord is saying, I'm walking on earth, but it is in a different glory. The things that I'm doing, who I am, you know, I'm doing it because of a different glory, doxa, but 
now father since he's coming to the end of his earthly ministry he's saying glorify me together with the glory which i had with you before the world was okay and that is why we said you know we use that word sonship just to explain the kind of glory with which he walked on the earth okay the things that he did because of that glory or uh, what he did by the holy spirit okay now the, the beautiful thing is this, right? The Lord wants to give us that same thing. The Lord wants to clothe us with that same glory, or He has done that. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Because He's the same Holy Spirit. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 5, we saw that He emptied Himself when He came on the earth. And that is why He prays that prayer. He emptied Himself not of deity, you're not saying that he was not God. He was. He, he can never stop being God. But the things that he did, he did by the, with the help of the, help or empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to um, um, John chapter 14 now. Okay. John chapter 14 and verse 12 onwards. John chapter 14 and verse 12. The Lord says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works uh, than these he will do because I go to my Father. You know? It's an it's a amazing statement. Okay, I can see some scriptures. Um, Cyril is putting... Thank you, Cyril. Maybe I, I, I can share the notes as well, if you want, uh, the references. Okay. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So we, we are looking at John chapter 14, right? And, um, and verse 12 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, uh, he will do also. Okay, so that's an astounding statement. Whatever he did, he's saying... The works that I did, or works that I do, you know, he's, show, he's telling the disciples, the works that I'm doing, you will do also. Okay. And then he says, greater works than these you will do. Okay. And he gives the reason for that. He says, because I go to my father. Okay. Understood? Okay. So no doubt in this. Everybody's clear. He's saying, this is what you will do. Whatever I'm doing, you will do, right? In plain terms, this is what he's saying. Whatever I'm doing, you will do in terms of ministry because I go to my Father. Then look, let's look at the next verse. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So which means in all the doing, the Father needs to be glorified, the Son needs to be glorified. Okay. And he says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Then, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So who is he referring to? Verse 15, oh, sorry, verse 16, and I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, right? Um, and that's the word he says, the helper, the parakletos. And the paraclete, and he will abide with you forever. He will stay with you forever. The spirit of truth, uh, whom the world cannot receive, because it can neither see him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay. So the Lord is saying something very important here. You know, you will do what I do because I go to my Father. And then he says, because I go to my Father. I'm going to do something. I'm going to send the, the helper and he is going to be with you forever. right? And he is the one. In other words, he's saying, because I go to my father and because I send the helper and he's the one who will actually enable you to do what I am doing. Right? In simple words, he's just saying, this is what he will do. Um, verse 20, and then we, we read about all the things that 
that the Holy Spirit or all the good things the Holy Spirit brings, brings into a, a believer's life. Okay, so let's look at some of the things that the Lord Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit. What did the Lord Jesus teach his disciples um, about the Holy Spirit that's relevant for us even today? Okay, so let's look at um, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 20. Right, Matthew 10 and verse 20. Um, Okay, so he, he here, uh, let, maybe we should just read from verse 19 onwards. Okay? But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So he's foretelling something to the disciples. He's talking about the coming persecution or arrests that would happen. So he's, he's saying, you know, when you, when you are arrested, when you are persecuted, don't worry about what you should speak in defense or in explaining what you were doing. Don't worry about that. For the spirit of my father, he says, the spirit of your father, he will speak. Okay. In other words, he's saying he will give you the words to speak. He will give you the wisdoms to speak. He will give you the information to convey. Okay, And what is the situation when they are persecuted? Okay, So the Lord Jesus is telling us, saying, when you are persecuted and when you are brought up before these people, don't worry. Oh, what should I speak? You know, what should I explain? Don't worry. The Holy Spirit will enable you to speak. Okay, Then Mark chapter 13 and verse 11. Mark chapter 13 and verse 11. Okay. Same uh, about, um, uh, about when, okay, this is how he says it. But when they arrest you and deliver you, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. For whatever is given to you in that hour, speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, um, again, the context is being arrested, being persecuted for their faith and for following Jesus. And so he's saying, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will speak. Okay, now what could be a wrong application of this? A wrong application of this would be whenever I need to speak, whenever I need to teach, whenever I need to preach, I'm not going to worry what I'm going to preach. That will be the wrong application. You know, I'm just going to come. The Holy Spirit will give me the words and only that I'm going to speak. I'm not going to prepare. I'm not going to, because it says, you know, don't premeditate. Don't think about what you're going to speak. So is that right or wrong? It's wrong, right? That's not the right thing. So the context here is persecution. Don't, you know, think about what you're going, how you're going to defend and etc. Right? Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on to another thing, uh, which the, whole, the Lord Jesus taught. And uh, he taught about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I think we kind of addressed this a little bit. And it's in Matthew chapter 12. Okay, Matthew chapter 12. And um, if you look at verse 22, okay, Matthew 12, verse 22, this is what happened. Let me just read out. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind, and mute. Right? So he was possessed, he was blind, he was mute. Um, terrible combination and it says and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both began uh, both spoke and saw and all the multitudes were amazed and said could this be the son of David meaning could this be the Messiah right was prophesied could this be the Messiah now when the Pharisees heard it what did they hear they heard uh, people exclaiming you know maybe he's the Messiah maybe he's the one whom we are expecting, you know, uh, whom the scriptures talk about. So when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So here the Lord Jesus does a very notable miracle. There's someone who's oppressed, who's possessed, who's unable to see, unable to speak. Right? And then uh, the, his eyes are open, his ears are open, and the demon is 
you know, uh, been, he's been delivered from the demon, he's cast out. So people are saying, uh, I mean, the Pharisees are saying, Jesus is doing this by the power of Beelzebub. Okay, by the power of the evil one, by the power of the evil, uh, evil spirit. And then the Lord explains, he says in verse 25, uh, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Okay, which means that they were Pharisees who were casting out demons uh, and so he's saying, you know, if I cast out by Beelzebub, by what authority, by all, what power are they casting them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Verse 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Saying, the rule and reign of the king, the rule and reign of God has come upon you. He's saying, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. So, the Lord is pointing or teaching us one very important lesson. The demons are cast out by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not because of man's authority or man's voice or loudness of the voice, nothing. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the rule and reign of the King, the rule and reign of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. And then he goes on to say, how can uh, one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. He who do does not gather uh, with me scatters abroad. Verse 31. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. So he's talking about blasphemy, meaning you know, something that is said against God in a derogat derogatory manner, right? You say something um, that, uh, or insult, or you pull down his name, and that's, a, you know, something unholy against someone uh, or God who's holy. So that's blasphemy. So here is the Lord Jesus saying, what they have done actually is blasphemy. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that, you know, this will not be forgiven. And it's a serious thing. Um, so the question is this, you know, maybe I said something about the Holy Spirit. I made fun of the Holy Spirit. You know, will I be forgiven? Am I condemned? Am I, you know, in a place of not ever being forgiven? So that's the question. What do you think? Because we should, you know, just like how we understood the previous one, teaching about the Lord Jesus, in the context of persecution, it will be given to us what to say. Same way, we should apply it correctly, whatever we are learning now, right? So, so what? What do you think? In other words, the question is, what is this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What do you understand from what we have learnt so far? Anyone? When we are denying the Holy Spirit's work, okay, is that blasphemy? Speaking against the Holy Spirit, okay, so is that blasphemy? Insulting the Holy Spirit. Okay. So here, you know, we see something unique. Okay, the Pharisees, um, what are the people saying? People are saying, this is the Messiah. You know, he's, he's done this miracle. This person was blind and mute. And wow, now he, he can see. He, he can speak. So this is surely the work of God. Can this be the Messiah? Right? And to that, the Pharisees were saying that the work that he, that he does, the work that he's doing, 
is empowered by Satan. And the work of deliverance is not the Holy Spirit, but it's Satan. Okay. And why do they say that? They did not want to acknowledge that here was someone who was the Messiah. You see that over and over again, right? Um, uh, wherever you know the the, the people come, and um, especially okay, um, if you if you look at the same chapter, chapter twelve, and if you go to verse nine, so he goes into the synagogue, and behold, there was a man with a withered hand. Okay, so he couldn't stretch it out. And they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Why did they say that? The Bible says that in verse number, verse 10, chapter 12, verse 10, it says there was a man whose hand was not working well. Okay, he's in the synagogue. Now Jesus goes into the synagogue and they ask him this question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? when we are supposed to rest and not do any work. Is it lawful? Is it a right thing? Now, why did they ask that question? Huh? Sorry? Test him. Yes. What does that mean? To test. So they can? Okay, uh, I think somebody raised a question. I mean, hand, go ahead, please. Um, who's that? Shani? Yeah, go ahead. Um. Oh, um, they were just trying to, I guess, catch him and doing something wrong because they were jealous. I'm sorry, say that again? I said they were just trying to trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong that was against the rules because they were jealous of him. Okay. They wanted to catch him do something wrong. Okay. I think Gertrude uh, and um, okay, Shani also says, okay, jealous of Jesus, um, trying to find faults. The Sabbath is holy and no work is done, etc. Right. If you look at the same verse, no, verse, um, um, verse 10, it says, this last part of the verse, that they might accuse him, right? That they might trap him, that they might accuse him. So the intention was not to learn. Well, hey, is it lawful to do this? Is, the intention was not to learn from Jesus, but to put Jesus down, to trap him, to accuse him. So that was their constant uh, motivation of their heart. So also with the Pharisees, the Pharisees, when they heard, you know, it was not from a place of learning. Of course, there were some who were, you know, uh, like Nicodemus, uh, who would come and wanted to know from Jesus. But here we see, you know, all of them, they wanted to accuse, they wanted to trap, and their questions were based on that. You know, how can we put him down? How can we trap him? How can we accuse him? Find something wrong with him, right? So the intentions were that, motivation was that. Because of which, they actually said that this work of God, see, they knew that this is something supernatural. This is something miraculous, right? Because the Lord Jesus says, hey, your people are also casting out in the name of Yehovah, in the name of Yahweh, you know, uh, there's power and they were casting out, right? The Jewish itinerant exorcists, you know, they, they were there doing ministry and uh, they were cast. So the Lord is saying, how, how do they do that? Is it because of God's power? Right? So they knew that this was God's power, but they were actually attributing that power to be the power of Satan. So knowing the truth, knowing that this is actually God's work, to say, no, this is the work of Satan, because you know they did not accept Jesus because they did not want to lose their maybe religious authority, position, whatever be the reason. Knowing the truth, being hypocritical, and saying that something that God is doing is actually the work of the demon. Something that the Holy Spirit is doing to say that that's not the Holy Spirit, that's actually work of demon. Right? So that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Right? And it's not something that you might do it in ignorance or, or even willfully, 
you know, you say something uh, and, um, you know, so you can be forgiven. You know, when you, when you go back and ask the Lord for forgiveness, the Lord is able to save to the uttermost. He will definitely forgive. Okay. So if any of anybody's feeling, no, oh, maybe I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you know, um, you know, this is what it is. When you talk about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, this is the category. You know for sure that this is the work of God. You know for sure that's a supernatural work, not man can do, but you attribute that supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to the work of demons, to the work of Satan, then that's a blasphemy. Okay. So the Lord says this, you know, there's a serious thing, serious matter. Okay. So that's what we learn from here. Okay. Um, what else? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, Shani. So you're saying that because I always thought that blasphemy blasphemy can be forgiven, but you're saying that it that it can if somebody could ask for forgiveness if they do blaspheme. I'm sorry, tell me again. So I said I always thought that blasphemy wasn't um you know was unforgivable. I, I was always taught that that's the one thing that you know the Lord will forgive you. You know it's unforgivable that he won't forgive you for. So you're saying that. If somebody does blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that God can't forgive them. I just try and get an understanding. Yeah, I'm just saying the context in which um, you know the Lord is explaining this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because um, you know if you look at uh, the lives of all the, I'm sorry, uh, you're here. I'm, if you look at the lives of all the, you know, all the people who were enemies of the cross, enemies of Christ, you know, Paul himself, you know, he he persecuted, he did things against um, the what was called the way he did but there was forgiveness right and so we throughout his church history we see people who did um, you know people who are worshiping satan satan worshipers who did it in ignorance and maybe as an act of rebellion from a place of hurt whatever the lord is talking about people who are who know the truth right who know the truth and who blaspheme God despite knowing the truth and he's he's qualifying blasphemy as that yeah that's the and he's saying this will not be forgiven hope that helps okay thank you yes that clarifies right. a lot thank you right right okay so let's move on um let's move on to what the Lord taught further about the Holy Spirit okay so it's so it's now these are the words of the Lord Jesus. So, uh, so let's um, you know let's just pay attention. What is he saying about the Holy Spirit? Okay, um, okay. Let's look at some of those references. Luke chapter eleven and verse thirteen. What is the Lord saying? If you, being evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Okay, let's look at the context. Let's start reading from verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. For him who knocks it will be opened. Okay, then he talks about verse 11. If a son asks for bread from any father, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Okay, so he's just contrasting. If you're asking, if your son is in need, you're asking your earthly father, father gave me bread, will you give him, no, I don't have bread, take this. Or, you know, I have bread, but you take a stone in, instead. Okay, so he's talking about the, uh, you know, the foolishness of such a response. And he's saying, if you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay, so that should settle some of our fears or sense of unworthiness. You know, we sometimes say, you know, I'm not worthy enough. I'm not good enough. He's talking about the goodness of God, goodness of the Father in giving, in extending uh, the, the work or the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. Right? And we ask, he says, how much more will your Heavenly Father? You know, because we know how to give, give good gifts to our children. How much more your heavenly father, right? So he's not the one who is withholding the spirit from, from giving to anyone. Okay, so, so the Lord talks about the heart of the 
father. This is the heart of the father. He desires that you and I be filled with the spirit and walk in the spirit. Okay? Okay, so we don't have to, you know, twist God's arm. We don't have to prove to him that we are worthy. Uh, we don't have to, you know, come to a place of saying, I'm holy enough now, Lord, so please fill me. No, right? The Father knows how to give good gifts to his children. Okay, John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Uh, this is the conversation between the Pharisee Nicodemus and with Jesus. So uh, let me just quickly just paraphrase a few things. So Nicodemus comes, he says, Rabbi, you are a teacher. And so um, no one can do these things unless you do them, etc. unless God is with him. And then he says, Un Lord Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? Unless one is born again. So Nicodemus is puzzled, saying, how can a person be born again? Right? Um, so what are you saying? How can I, you know, he, because he was a grown man. And he's saying, you know, how can I be born again? He's looking at, what is he considering? He's considering the natural. It's considering the natural birth, where the Lord is teaching about something else. Okay, so the Lord says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he's continuing to talk about how one can see the kingdom of God, how one can en enter into the kingdom of God. This is how it is. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Okay, so Nicodemus asks the quest question was, how can a man be born again? Right? Uh, how can he enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? So what birth is he talking about? The natural birth, the physical birth. Right? So he's saying, how can that happen? He's all the time thinking about the physical thing. But Jesus is talking about spiritual matters. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And he's saying, unless one is born of water and the spirit. Now, water uh, could refer to many things. Right? Um, Water is a picture, type of the Holy Spirit. And here the Lord is saying, unless one is bought, one, born of water and the Spirit, he's contrasting between physical birth and spiritual birth. Okay? Yeah, you're born of your mother. That's a natural birth. So he's talking about water, which is a natural element, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Okay? Unless one is born of the Holy Spirit. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay. So then, um, the Lord continues. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's talking about this born again experience, which is a spiritual experience for those of us who are born in the flesh. right? So the Lord is saying that which is, he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, cannot see the kingdom of God. Saying, again, distinguishing between physical and the spiritual. He's saying, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay? Then, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone born of the spirit so he's saying you know he's talking about how one is born again and uh, the nature of one who's born again he's saying you know you see you don't see the wind but you hear the wind and because you see the outworking of it and so is everyone you don't know the source where it comes from where it goes uh, you know so is everyone who is born of the spirit in the sense the way they are born again in the spirit the way the holy spirit causes them to be born again. Well, it's a spiritual matter. We don't see it. We, we cannot understand it. We cannot tell. But he says, so is everyone who is born of his spirit. Okay. So the Lord is teaching about what happens to a person when he is born of the spirit. So, the, so what we understand is that the Lord is teaching, saying the Holy Spirit, he is the one who causes one to be born again, this new birth, this new life. You know, we use those terms. I, I was, you know, I got a new life. Right? I was a changed person. I, it's my old life, in, in my old life, I used to do it, but I'm, I'm a changed person. Right? And how did that change happen? Right? Something deep inside happened. Right? It is not that we decided 
yes of course we decided it's not that it's like a resolution and we are following through with the resolution because you know of our our own self control and our own will no something happened in our spirit right and i'm sure you you learning in this uh, whole subject of in christ identity how we are spirit soul and body are we learning it right 1 Thessalonians 5 23 spirit soul and body so our spirit which was dead to god comes alive to him meaning it's now our spirit man is now open sensitive to the things of god uh, desires the things of god uh, is able to communicate with the holy spirit how does it happen because our spirit man is born again there's a spiritual rebirth that happens okay so the lord is teaching about the born again experience okay is baptism necessary for the holy spirit um, you put no okay so is baptism necessary in the sense um okay is there any way to see and the notes online well actually uh, i can see myself and the notes probably if you are connecting from a phone that might be a little difficult i think um shani no i'm on my computer and i can't see you at all oh that's strange I can only see the notes. How's it? How's it? Only the notes. Okay. Okay, I will figure that out. I'm not sure. Okay. Um how to okay, do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Okay, so um so we see that um um the lord is talking about okay we let us these questions, right? Okay, so the question is is water baptism necessary for the holy spirit to come into our heart no we we see very clearly and we will also learn further that we receive the holy spirit by faith right and uh, when we're talking specifically about holy spirit baptism yes that is also by faith jesus is the one who baptizes us okay and how when we receive jesus lord and savior we are sealed by the holy spirit and that's because of a act of faith okay and not because of water baptism okay um okay any other question okay i think that's it okay we'll take a break now and then we'll come back uh, thank you i can see you now uh yeah that's <laughs> because uh I stop sharing the notes yeah okay okay sam is uh, posting something on the chat i think that's to help you so you can yeah, so you can uh, take the when you see the list of people you can just uh, pin pastor jay kumar so you can see both the notes and him 